Hello and welcome to another uh, Saturday Radiology session by Team Radio Gyan. Today's speaker is Dr. Chasim Koya, uh, and he'll be talking about imaging of uh, MRI imaging of the knee. Before we move on to his talk, standard disclaimer like every time, whatever we discuss today and in our future or past lectures is not should not be considered medical advice. This is for uh, teaching and educational purposes only. Secondly, what, uh, relevant video links, uh, uh, I will leave those in the description section. So for those who are watching it later, you can check them later. And for those who are watching it live, you can check these uh, once you're done with the lecture. Also, I leave uh, timestamps to videos so that you can jump to specific sections of the video. Um, that's uh, that's a few instructions that I, I wanted to share. And uh, 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 we'll move on to our talk for today. So Dr. Koya uh, owns his own uh, diagnostic center. He's a consultant radiologist at uh, Dr. Chasim's uh, Diagnostics Calicut and uh, Monana Hospital. He's also the joint secretary for IRI and uh, president of the Calicut chapter of uh, Indian uh, Radiologic, uh, the uh, National Radiological Association, that is the IRI. Uh, so with that, I would uh, not waste any more time, and I would request uh, Jasim uh, uh, to uh, start sharing his uh, screen. Over to you, Jasim. Hi, Amar. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on. I'll just start uh, sharing my screen. Just tell me sure. if it's working, okay? Can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay. So... Uh, thanks again, Amar. Uh, let's uh, basically I've split the talk into two different sessions. In the first, it will be pretty much the basics where we discuss the normal anatomy and the normal imaging appearances and some sort of injuries. And then the next talk will be more of an advanced session. So hopefully at the end of these two talks, you will uh, have a good idea of starting off with MRI reporting of the knee and to uh, uh, advanced intermediate or expert level, hopefully. So let's start off. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. I have no financial disclosures to make. I uh, used Philips and uh, Siemens 1.5T MRA machine, oh, uh, machines over the last 10 years or so. And yeah, one more uh, thing to say is that uh, I've heard some of my friends from school also have joined this talk. So I uh, take no responsibility in any of the comments that they make. So this, Let's go on to this. This is the first image. Uh, I see uh, Amar is getting worried. Uh, don't worry, Amar. It's, uh, uh, I'm still, this is the right talk. This is the MRI of the brain. So why I put this in is uh, because when you give uh, some uh, radiologists, two radiologists, this image, uh, both of them are going to call it the GBM, okay? So there is a good degree of uh, inter-observer uh, 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 there's, it is, it is uh, the, both the radiologists are going to call it the same thing. So, uh, but again, if you have another case like this, the radiologist one is going to call it an abscess, the radiologist two is going to call it an abscess as well. But what, what if you put in something like this? So this is when uh, sometimes uh, the first radiologist will call it a grade two ACL sprain. The other radiologist will call it probably a normal ACL. It looks like normal to me. So this is when things get confusing. So uh, especially in MSK cases, uh, this does happen. This tends to happen where uh, the, the inter-observer, uh, uh, the, the, the concordance between the two observers is uh, sometimes difficult to achieve. So why does this happen? Now this happens when you always have to have a detailed knowledge of the normal MRI appearance of various, various structures on the knee. And uh, also there's a problem with the use of unstandardized terms. Sometimes we, uh, some radiologists tend to use the term as a grade two tear, where, whereas we know that the grade two is not necessarily a tear, a tear as in a full thickness tear in uh, menisci or the ligaments. I'll come to that in a bit. And there are certain mimics which uh, do mimic tears and which we have to know so, so that we don't erroneously interpret uh, certain normal appearances as, as uh, abnormalities. And uh, there's also a problem with having low field MRI. Low field MRI is anything less than one Tesla. So if you have a 0.35 Tesla or a 0.5 Tesla doing an MR imaging of uh, joints, uh, there is always a propensity to sometimes overdiagnose abnormalities or sometimes underdiagnose abnormalities. So you need to have, uh, as a normal standard of care, you need to have 1.5 T or above 
to do uh, imaging of the joints. Now, th these are just a couple of uh, fundamentals. Again, is 0.3 Tesla, 0.35 Tesla sufficient? Uh, you know it's not. Uh, 1.5T and 3T, uh, the diagnostic accuracy between the two, as far as joints are concerned, is not very much. Uh, the, the relevance between having, uh, of course, th there's no debating the fact that uh, 3T is going to give superior quality images, but does it necessarily contribute to diagnostic accuracy? Uh, it is sufficient to have a very good radiologist reporting in a 1.5T for cases of joints. That is seen in majority of the cases. Uh, what are the sequences that you have to look for? So this is the bread and butter okay, of all the joints. You have to do what's known as a PDFS or a proton density fat suppressed images or a PD. These are essential. You need to have them in all the three planes. Then T2, W also for the knee joint is essential. I'll come to that in a bit, why it is uh, necessary. And uh, so these are the things, PDFS, T2. It's always good to have a T1 sequence as well. Now these are optional sequences. You have something called DES, Watts, Vista. These are all 3D sequences, which are uh, used uh, to, to assess certain structures in the knee. Uh, gradient sequence, you can have a GRE image. Uh, for certain speci specific indications, but it's not necessary to do it in all cases. And uh, there's something called as opposed phase imaging, which in which uh, in certain instances you can use those. I'll come to that in a bit in, again. There's also something called a cartigram, which is a specific sequence which is used to uh, assess the articular cartilages. And contrast uh, MRI is also uh, used in certain instances. Now, the basic sequences. Uh, this is, again, like I said earlier, this uh, PDFS sequence is the bread and butter. This is what you have to look at. Um, then you have the T2-weighted image. You know that this is a T2-weighted image. We can see, you can see the, uh, the uh, can you see my pointer? I don't know, one second, let me just take my laser pointer, yeah. So the fluid is uh, bright and the menisci are dark. The, the fa fatty marrow is seen and that is bright. Therefore, you know that this is a T2-weighted image. Here, the joint fluid or the synovial fluid is dark, whereas the, the fat, uh, the subcutaneous fat and the marrow is bright. Therefore, that is a T1-weighted image. Now, as a rule of thumb, pathologies are usually bright on T2, W, and related sequences. That is uh, PDFS or fat suppressed sequences, and they are dark on T1. That is the rule of thumb, but it does not apply in all cases, but this is how it is generally, especially in knee joint injuries. So. PDFS is similar to T2, but it is with fat suppression and it is highly fluid sensitive. Therefore, it is the mainstay of MSK uh, MRI. And the advantage is lesion detection, but again, it has a disadvantage of overdiagnosing injuries. So let's come to the normal anatomy. Coming on to the first, the sagittal anatomy on PDFS. Let's just identify the structures. First, we of course have to orient ourselves to the normal imaging of the knee joint. And then subsequently, you can uh, add on to your uh, knowledge of the MRI of the knee joint. So here we are starting sagittal. So first things first, you have to assess whether you're going medial to lateral or lateral to medial. The easy way to look is uh, just look for the fibula. If you see the fibula, then you know that you are lateral. So this is the fibula, this is the tibia. You can see that. So you're starting from lateral and you're going towards the medial. So at the fibula, you can see this V-shaped structure. So this forms what's called the postrolateral complex. This is part of the postrolateral corner of the knee joint. Um, so I'll uh, again, the postrolateral and postromedial corners, I'll come to that in a bit. This, this is the lateral meniscus here. So that's the body of the lateral meniscus. The meniscus, remember, is generally dark on PDFS sequences and T2-weighted sequences. So this is the body of the lateral meniscus. That's the posterior horn. That's the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Okay, and that's the patella tendon, that's the patella here. And uh, again, you can see that this is the uh, fibula. You're going more medially. So this is the anterior horn, that's the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And if you go further down, you can see that the part of the meniscus is coming in contacting the tibial surface. And that's the anterior root of the lateral meniscus. That's the posterior root of the lateral meniscus. And when you reach here, you can see this uh, structure over here, which is sort of parallel to the Blumen Sart line. That's the anterior cruciate ligament. And that's the posterior cruciate ligament behind. 
Okay, what you can, the, the, the fundamental thing that you have to know is that the anterior cruciate ligament may be seen in one or two set slices on sagittal image, generally on two sections. And the orientation of the ACL is such that it's slightly oblique. So uh, if you plan the, uh, uh, the planes, uh, the sequences along the plane of the true sag of the knee, generally because of the obliquity, it is, uh, you, it, you are prone to certainly, uh, I mean, to, to overdiagnose uh, certain injuries like uh, uh, tear or so on. So that's the PCL there. That's the anterior root of the medial meniscus. Now we are going more medially. That's the posterior root of the medial meniscus. Then you have the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And then when you reach medial most, you'll be able to see the body of the medial meniscus. Okay. So MCL will not be well appreciated on this, but you can well see the, uh, what's called the postromedial corner. I'll come to that in a bit. So these are the structures that you will be able to identify on a sagittal image. Now coming on to the coronal anatomy of the knee. Um, that's the, again, or for orienting yourself, the best thing to do is to look at the fibula. So that's the fibula there. So you know, this is left. I mean, sorry, this is lateral and this is medial. And therefore, you know that this is a left knee, MRI of the left knee. So uh, that's the fibula there. Again, this is the posterolateral corner. That is part, that's the biceps tendon, which is coming and getting attached here. That's the biceps femoris muscle. It's coming and att getting attached to the head of the fibula. So what connects the lateral femoral condyle with the fibula is the lateral collateral ligament. That's the lateral collateral ligament. And if you look further down, you'll be able to see the um, further posteriorly. As you go further posteriorly, you'll be able to see this is the popliteus muscle. And therefore, this is the popliteus tendon, which is going and getting attached, inserted rather, to the lateral femoral condyle. And if you trace the popliteus tendon to the fibula, you'll be able to see what's called the popliteofibular ligament. Okay, these are all part of the posterolateral corner. And that's the lateral meniscus. Again, you will be able to trace both the anterior root of the lateral meniscus and the posterior root of the lateral meniscus, the part where it goes and gets attached to the tibia. So that's the body of the lateral meniscus. And that's the ACL here. So you can see that the ACL is coming and this, this is from anterior to posterior. So that's the tibial attachment of the ACL at the uh, anterior tibial spine. And you can see it's going further posteriorly. As it goes posteriorly, it becomes darker and darker. So that is one key point that you have to remember when you assess the ACL. Generally, the ACL does show subtle hyperintensity or mild bright signal towards its tibial attachment. Whereas to, uh, generally towards the femoral attachment, as it goes, towards the femoral attachment, as you scroll towards the femoral attachment, that means towards the posterior and lateral aspects, it becomes darker and darker. That is one key thing that you have to remember uh, that is um, uh, regarding the normal anatomy of the ACL. So the same thing gets reversed as far as the PCL is concerned. Generally, the tibial attachment of the PCL, that's the PCL there. The tibial attachment of the PCL is darker and towards the uh, femoral attachment of the PCL, you may sometimes see subtle hyperintense signal, which may be normal. It uh, does not necessarily mean that this, these hy subtle hyperintense signals are abnormal. Now that's the meniscus, the medial meniscus. So you come to the anterior root of the medial meniscus. That's the anterior horn. That's the body of the medial meniscus. That's the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and the posterior root of the medial meniscus. So, oh, Always, when you look at menisci or cruciate ligaments or any other ligament for that matter, you always have to assess them in their entirety. Number one, you have to assess them in all the three planes and all the sequences. Now, it's very important to do all these three, three things so, as, so that you can avoid missing out uh, abnormalities or injuries. Now, that's the medial collateral ligament. So the medial collateral ligament has a superficial and a deep component. That's the superficial component of the MCL. That's a very long ligament. And that's the tibial attachment. That's the femoral attachment. And that's the deep component of the MCL. So you have a menisco femoral attachment ligament as well as a menisco tibial uh, component or a ligament, menisco tibial ligament. So the same thing, there is a menisco femoral and a menisco tibial uh, ligament of the uh, postromedial corner as well. I'll discuss a little bit more about the postromedial corner in the next session. Okay. 
So these are the things that you'll be able to identify. Of course, you'll be able to identify the uh, muscles and the subcutaneous tissue and the marrow generally uh, will be dark on PDFS images. If you do see bright signals, generally in uh, cases of trauma, they will be uh, bone contusions. So uh, the patterns of bone, co bone contusions in, uh, in the MRI of the knee do help in identifying what the pathology or what the injury uh, uh, could have been. So now coming on to the axial anatomy, that's the tibia, that's the fibula. So this is lateral and it's medial. So you're looking at the MRI of the left knee again. So that's the tibia. You can see that these, uh, again, you'll be able to trace all these structures. You can see the biceps femoris uh, getting inserted here at the fibula. And that's the lateral femoral condyle here. Therefore, that's the lateral collateral ligament. I hope you're able to trace that. And the popliteus, this is the popliteus muscle over here. Okay, just deep to the popliteal vessels. That's the popliteus tendon. Just keep your eye on this. You can trace it all the way till the insertion in the lateral femoral condyle. So these are the posterior lateral corner structures. That's the ACL here. This is the ACL. You can see at the lateral femoral condyle, uh, the medial surface of the lateral femoral condyle, that's the ACL attachment. As you go inferiorly, you can see it becomes wider and wider, and that's where it gets inserted, uh, attached at the uh, tibial uh, surface, uh, anterior tibial spine. Okay, this structure, this hypointense structure here, that's the PCL. So here you have the posterior, I mean, the tibial uh, attachment of the PCL. And as you go further uh, superiorly, that's the femoral attachment of the PCL. So again, these are the menisci. Menisci, because of the orientation, uh, it's not very clearly seen or very well identified. But in certain instances, of course, when you're looking for radial tears or bucket handle tears, uh, these axial images do come in handy. So that's the medial collateral ligament over here. Again, the, you have to trace them right from the femoral attachment all the way down to the tibial attachment. So you have the MCL here, just posterior to the MCL, you'll be having the uh, posteromedial corner in what's called the posterior oblique ligament or POL. Uh, and these are the uh, patella retinacula. This is the medial patellofemoral ligament or the MPFL, that's the lateral patellofemoral ligament or the LPFL. And these are the pes anserinus tendons, okay? So these are the structures you'll be able to identify on um, MRF on the axial sequences. Now, this is the T2 weighted sequence. It does beautifully demonstrate the patellar articular cartilage and the trochlear cartilage. That's the ACL here. So remember that the ACL is generally darker towards the femoral attachment. And as you go inferiorly, this subtle hyperintense signal within the ACL is normal. No, do not erroneously diagnose this as a ACL injury or a partial tear. So that's the PCL. Generally, it will be darker than the ACL. So that's the PCL, a thicker band and is getting attached to the TPL attachment here. You have the posterolateral corner structures, the posteromedial corner structures, the MCL, the menisci. These are the menisci, the dark signals over here. These are the menisci, the patella retinacula, the patellofemoral ligaments, and uh, these are the muscles and pessensorinous tendons. So again, this, this is the sagittal anatomy. Uh, the menisci generally will appear darker on uh, a T2 weighted image. So these are the, uh, the, the lateral, I mean, uh, we are going again, this is from medial to lateral, how do you know? Because you can't see the fibula here. So that's the body of the medial meniscus and uh, anterior posterior horns of the medial meniscus. That's the ACL here which is seen as a dark hypo, uh, uh, structure, hypointense structure in its continuity. And that's the PCA. And then you can see the uh, lateral meniscus and the fibula, the posterior lateral corner. Now regarding the medial meniscus, remember that it is actually um, a, a common uh, uh, confusion among novice radiologists to uh, wrongly diagnose um, small subtle hyperintense signals within the menisci as tears or uh, injuries. So remember that the meniscus does not necessarily have to be jet black on all sequences. Uh, sometimes you can have a normal meniscus with a subtle focal hyperintense hyper signal as is seen in this case. This may be a grade one signal and it may be normal. The patient may not have any symptoms at all. Now this is the lateral meniscus. Generally they are dark. 
but the uh, this is how you grade basically how you grade meniscal injury grade one signal is when there is a just a subtle focal hypo hyper intense signal within the meniscus so it's an intermeniscal hyper intense focus rather rather than a, a through and through injury so that's the grade two injuries when um, there is a hyper intense signal which is more than the grade one signal and it can contact one of the surfaces of the um uh, of the articular cartilages either i mean of the meniscus either, either the superior inferior or the inner margin or the posterior margin so that is a grade 2 injury grade 3 is when there is a complete tear and uh, the types of tears i'll be discussing in a short while can i uh, i hope i'll be able to can i look look at the answers one second yeah uh, this is a, a type of a meniscal injury i just wanted to know uh, is this a tear can i have a yes or no i'm just looking for answers i don't know if there is a delay i just want to know how many of you feel that this is a meniscal tear and how many of you feel that this is not a meniscal tear trying to get uh, there's like a very minimal uh, a couple of seconds yeah okay just a second okay uh, stuti has said no someone said contusion ali has said contusion Okay, how many of you feel that this is a meniscal tear? I can just you can just give me a yes or no answer. That would do. Okay, so basically, yeah, uh, Mangesh has said that's a tear. Doctor Deepesh Yadav has said tear. Uh, yes, I'm getting a lot of yes, lot of yeses. Okay, yeah, so a lot more yeses than noes. Okay, so the one thing that you have to know is that if this Uh, hyper intensity okay fundamentally you have to understand one thing um when a hyper intense signal uh in the meniscus reaches the surface do not be in a hurry to call it a tear okay when you have a hyper intense signal reaching the surface that does not necessarily mean it's a tear the uh, the definition of a tear is when it equivocally breaches the surface you have to be absolutely sure that it breaches the surface it has broken the surface and only then you call it a tear why that is so because if you look very closely you can see you can just about make out a subtle high point and line over here at least you have a doubt of whether it is uh, torn or not whether it has reached the surface or not okay over here you can say maybe yeah has it reached the surface it has reached close to the surface that much you are sure but it's not unequivocal so whenever you have an equivocal signal which is reaching the surface you always 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 have to look at t2 as well so that is where t2 becomes so important look at t2 as well and if you can see a breach on t2 because uh, as i said earlier the t2 sequence is generally darker the meniscus on t2 is generally darker and pdfs has a propensity to over diagnose tear so do not look at it only on pdfs always have a look at t2 as well now just have a look at this one and what would you call it is this a tear is it a yes or no okay is this a tear and now you can see that there is an irregular hyper intensity which is extending from the posterior margin and this is a t2 weighted sequence mind you yes so lot more people coming for a yes this time okay ali has said yes mangesh has said yes and yes yes this is a tear because in this you can definitely see that there is a breach no so when you can see the breach and if you can see an irregularity so this is the definition of tear how to differentiate grade 2 from grade 3 uh if the signal is unequivocally contacting the surface and there is an abnormal morphology that means that there's an irregularity of the surface without prior surgery okay when you have post operative meniscus it's a whole different ball game so you need to have it uh, look at it in a different view all point all, all the uh, all the way but then when uh, when you have uh, an irregularity of the surface and a hyper intensity reaching that margin then that is a grade 3 injury now what are the types of meniscal tears this is what we have to know and that there are different types of meniscal tears and when you have the orientation of these tears uh, then you will be able to identify them better and characterize them better on uh, while you report the mri of the knee okay so you have this is what's called a radial tear okay then you have a, a horizontal tear a horizontal tear basic, basically it reaches it is extending from peripheral surface and it reaches the inner margin okay that's the horizontal tear suppose it goes to the inferior surface 
or the superior surface, you imagine a three-dimensional structure of the meniscus. If it reaches the superior or inferior surface, that's what's called the flap tear, okay? And you have a longitudinal tear when it reaches both the superior and the inferior surface, and it, uh, it extends along the length. That's why it's called the longitudinal, along the length of the meniscus. It can be either small or a large one. It can be a small longitudinal tear or a large longitudinal tear where it extends right either from the body, posterior horn, and so on. But the fundamental thing is that it has to breach both the surfaces, both the superior and the inferior surfaces. Only then you call it a longitudinal tear. And the other types of tears is the bucket handle tear, which you are familiar with. That is a through and through. It reaches from the anterior horn through the uh, 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 body and the posterior horn of the meniscus and then flips over uh, like a bucket handle. So you have a, a, a meniscus like that, which is torn and it flips over to the other side. And that's, that's a bucket handle tear. And this is the flap tear, which is either going superiorly or inferiorly. And this is what's called a parrot beak tear, which is very similar to a radial tear. So when you have a small radial or a parrot beak tear in the central zone, it may be difficult. You, it may be a little difficult to differentiate between the two. And apart from these different types of tears, what you have to know is um, there's what's called the root tear. That means either the, the anterior root or the posterior root also can be torn. And the other thing is you have to try to characterize whether it is in the central zone or in the peripheral zone. So ideally, a description of the meniscal tear, suppose I'm talking about a longitudinal tear, I should be able to define the tear as this uh, is a longitudinal tear involving the body and the posterior horn of the medial meniscus in the peripheral zone. So that would be a better description of a meniscal tear rather than just calling it a grade three injury. So when you have this idea uh, of the different types of tears of menisci in mind, then it'll be easy for you to understand uh, the uh, different patterns when you look at it in different sequences. So when you have a sagittal image, it makes sense that when you have a tear like this, a longitudinal tear, if the, if the sequence is pl planned in this plane, you will have a hyper, hyper intense signal like that. If it's a longitudinal tear, it will reach the superior and the inferior surfaces. So basically what I'm trying to say is, this all these signs, this uh, empty meniscus sign, uh, or all the different signs or the empty root sign, all those different signs of the meniscal injury, or the double PCL sign. They are all basically uh, uh, helping us to image uh, or to assess what type of tear it is in different uh, planes. So if you imagine the plane uh, in which you're going, you will be able to uh, identify what type of tear it is and where it is located. So it makes sense that if you're looking at it in an axial plane and you see a hyperintensity through and through like this, that's the radial tear. So you, it is involving the central zone it's involving the peripheral zone. So that's the radial tear in the, at the junction of the anterior horn and the body of the lateral meniscus uh, involving both the central and peripheral zones. That will be a more correct or a more uh, helpful description to the orthopedician rather than just calling it a grade three injury. So now sometimes you have just a subtle absence of signal when you're scrolling from lateral to medial or medial to lateral just in a focal area, you may be able to see a discontinuity. This may be a small radial tear, mind you. So when you are looking at it from sagittal sequences, always you have to look at uh, these, uh, uh, the menisci with a lot of uh, suspicion. And if you were to see a subtle hyperintensity like this, always make sure you double check on other planes, including coronal and axial, and try to characterize and try to identify if it is a radial tear. So this is a radial tear on coronal, that's a radial tear on sagittal. And now again, the, the, is this a tear? Yes or no? The answer is no, because you always have to compare it with a T2 weighted sequence. So this is not a tear when it is equivocally reaching the surface, especially on a PDFS. Now, is this a tear? Yes or no? I'll just wait for answers. Reem has said no. Okay, is this a tear? And if yes, then what type of a tear is it? Harshita says yes. Mangesh says yes. So you can see this hyperintense signals reaching from the posterior surface to the uh, superior surface, right? Posterior margin to the superior surface. It is reaching that surface, but 
the one thing that you have to note is that this is the lateral meniscus, right? And when it's a lateral meniscus towards the uh, the um, uh, the towards the posterior root of the lateral meniscus, you have what's called the ligament of Risberg or the meniscofemoral ligament. So you have a meniscofemoral ligament which arises from here and goes and attaches all the way to the medial femoral condyle. And that's what's called the ligament of Risberg. So this is what's called the uh, Risberg pseudo tear. So that's the PCL here. That's the ligament of Risberg. So if you were to trace that ligament, you will be able to identify that it goes posterior to the cruciate and goes and attaches all the way to the femur. So that's a meniscofemoral ligament. That's not a tear. So sometimes it, it you do have a tendency to overdiagnose lateral meniscus posterior horn tears. So remember that this is not a tear unless you, you should be able to trace it through and through. This is showing an avulsion injury of the anterior tibial spine. So you always have to confirm in other planes. So remember that this is the pseudo tear that we thought was a tear in the sagittal image. You can see this hyper intensity over here, which is shown by the, uh, by the arrowheads. So this can be wrongly interpreted as a tear. But if you see in other sequences, especially other planes rather, especially in axial as well as coronal, you can see that that's the ligament of Risberg. So that's the uh, ligament of Risberg pseudo tear. It is not a tear. Now let's go into some more examples of meniscal injuries. Now we'll just scroll through these images. I'll pause wherever necessary. And then I hope uh, some of you will be able to identify the pathology. Okay, this we are going from, this is a lateral meniscus and you can see that the meniscus is absent over here. Okay, I'm just scrolling through. Okay, are you able to see the pathology? If yes, please try to define what type of injury it is. I'll just wait for answer. Okay, that's the ACL there. Okay, so can you tell what type of injury it is? Can any of you say what type of injury it is? You can see that, that that's the expected site of lateral meniscus, right? In multiple sequences, you're not able to see it. So what type of injury is it? You can see something here as well. Someone said bucket handle. Somebody said, someone said empty go sign. So it's not a bucket handle necessarily. It's basically that there is absent meniscal tissue over there and it is not exactly a bucket handle, but it's what's called a flip meniscus, okay? Remember that sometimes when the bucket handle, I um, mean, sorry, when you are, the meniscus can uh, get flipped anteriorly or posteriorly. So this is actually the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, which is coming and sitting closely approximated with the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So that's what's called a uh, flipped meniscus. And uh, this is what's called anterior flipping. If it goes posteriorly, it's a posterior flipping. If it goes centrally, then it's a bucket handle tear. Okay, let's come on to the next case. I'm just scrolling through, just have a look. Okay, as a rule of thumb, let me just tell you this before we proceed. Uh, as a rule of thumb, when you look at the men's skull, always the anterior horn will be roughly half the size of the posterior horn. Okay, remember this, uh, about half the size. So the posterior horn should generally be double the size of the anterior horn. Keep that in mind. Whenever you see if, if the posterior horn is either smaller or if it is the same size as that of the anterior horn, always be aware that you may be looking at some sort of meniscal injury and try to look at it in all other planes and try to identify the pathology, okay? So here, you're looking at the anterior horn, you're looking at the posterior horn, something looks off. You're trying to find out what's wrong. You can see a hyper intensity there. You can see some sort of irregularity in the anterior horn and the posterior horn. I'm just scrolling through. If any of you have got the answer, please put it up. Okay, have you got the answer? You can see that there is diffuse irregularity throughout the anterior horn body and the posterior horn. Okay. That's not a flap tear necessarily. Again, don't call it a flap tear when you see only one sequence. So you can see this, this is also a meniscal tissue. So I hope you've got the answer there. Okay. 
So that's what's called the double PCL sign, right? So that is, this is what's called a bucket handle tear. That's a double PCL sign. Some of you have got it right. So when you, you look at it from the coronal plane, you can see that there is some, generally, again, another rule of thumb, when you look at um, structures in the coronal plane, especially when you're looking for bucket handle tears or loose bodies or uh, uh, any other uh, abnormalities like a cyclops lesion or something like that, generally towards the center, you should be able to identify the cruciates and nothing else, okay? If you were to see some meniscal tissue over there, then it may be a bucket handle tear or an anterior or an anterior or posterior flip meniscal tissue. Okay, so this high pointance structure over here, that's the ACL, that's the part of the PCL. This high pointance over here is part of the medial meniscus. So that's a bucket handle tear. So always when you see, when you have a doubt of a double PCL on a sagittal image, confirm it on coronal, look at the coronal and try to make sure that uh, there is a, another meniscal tissue over here, which shouldn't be here. And you can compare the size of the medial and the lateral menisci, the body, uh, bodies of both. And you can obviously, see that the medial is much smaller than the lateral and therefore that's a bucket handle tear. So this is what's called the interposed meniscus sign. Again, always make sure you look at all bucket handle tears or any other, any tear of the meniscus in all the three planes before you call it. So you have the ACL and PCL and you have an intruder over here and that's the flipped bucket handle portion. Coming on to the ligaments. Okay, what are the signs of ACL injury? Now, previously, um, when we had only a low field MR, when we had only a 0.3 T or so on, uh, it may be difficult to image the ACL and confidently call it as a tear or not. Okay, so then we may have to use, you know, indirect signs to make sure that this is actually uh, an ACL which is lax or insufficient. Now, what are the signs that you look for, the indirect signs that you look for for an ACL injury? These include, but are not limited to, the wavy appearance of the ACL. That means the ACL is not taut. It is rather, it is lax. There is a marked heterogeneity of the ACL, which is an indirect sign of an ACL injury. There's an inferior displacement of the ACL. Again, it is not parallel to the Blumenstadt line, but rather lying more inferiorly. There's what's called buckling of the PCL. The PCL uh, takes a more uh, uh, the acute angle and therefore it's called a buckling of the PCL. There's the anterior translation of a tibia. When you uh, take it from the lateral femoral condyle, when you take a measurement between the, uh, the posterior cortices of the uh, lateral femoral condyle and the lateral tibial condyle, if the distance is more than nine millimeters, it's what's called the anterior translation of the tibia. Uh, there's the pattern, specific pattern of bone contusion, which is associated with ACL injuries. There are other associated injuries that you have to look for. All these things, these are all indirect signs. They are not like directly depicting the ACL injury, but they do help. They're sort of ancillary findings to add on to the ACL injury. They are direct signs, of course, simply the discontinuity of the ACL. So that's, that's how you demonstrate laxity of the ACL. Normally the ACL has to be parallel to the Blumenstadt line. But if it is sort of oblique, um, if the angle is not, not exactly parallel, but slightly angulated from the bloom and salt line, then it is uh, indicative of ACL laxity. So this is, uh, you can uh, sort of, if you're uh, interested in cricket, you know that when there's an LBW, sometimes you have the Hawkeye system in which they will see if the, uh, if the ball is pitching, where the ball is pitching, how the ball is spinning, and whether it is uh, on the offside, whether it is onside, and so on and so forth, whether it's missing the wickets, uh, how fast it's coming. And th these are all indirect signs. You are not exactly seeing the ball going and hitting the wickets. But still, the umpire uses all these indirect signs uh, using, using the Hawkeye system with a DRS and uh, calls the uh, batsman out or he gives him uh, not out. So these are all indirect signs. It is only when the ball directly hits the wickets that you call him, yes, this is definitely out. So this is similar to what we have, that these, these things were there in the past. When you had a low field in MR, it, it does uh, you know, hold value to look at all these indirect signs. But now when you have 1.5 T and above, you are able to, in most cases, especially in a 3 T and above, you'll be able to demonstrate exactly how much of the fibers are toned 
and therefore you can call the acl tear more confidently you can either call it a partial tear which may be a low grade partial tear it may be a high grade partial tear or it may be a full thickness or a complete tear so uh, this is how you identify a normal acl again we had gone through that and that's a complete tear of the acl you can see the disruption of the fibers uh, and therefore you can call it a complete tear of the acl now the problem comes when you have a partial tear of the acl so that is when you have to look at two different uh, signs very important signs when you have a partial tear of the acl again when you have a partial tear again you are in a dilemma because you have to say whether it is a high grade partial tear or a low grade partial tear high grade partial tear uh, the acl is lax and insufficient and may need surgery low grade partial tear sometimes they can be treated conservatively and the patient can avoid an unnecessary surgery so it's it's important the onus is on the radiologist to call it a low grade or a high grade partial tear of course they'll do the clinical tests and all that but we have to uh, support the orthopedician with our diagnosis as well so how do we differentiate between the two there are two important signs which i i hope all of you will take this uh, home along with you this is a sort of a take home message when identifying acl injuries which is very often when we tend to uh, sort of uh, you know there is a difference in the the uh, the radiologist's opinion so this is what's called the mt notch sign you always have to look at the uh, femoral attachment okay if you see an empty notch sign that is a complete tear okay when there is an empty notch sign the femoral attachment is the most commonly uh, acl tears happen at the femoral attachment so when there is a complete absence that's an empty notch sign and the buckling of the pcl these are all ancillary findings that's the tibial translation that's the complete tear of the acl now again uh, this is this is what i wanted to say about Uh, acl whether calling it as a normal or a partial tear of the acl so how to differentiate between the two this is what's called the gap sign okay you look at the femoral attachment of the acl and if you can see a a, a hyperintense line separating the femoral the hypointensity of the acl from the femoral attachment of the acl that's what's called the gap sign okay so this is one of the signs that you have to keep in mind it is sort of akin to the uh, empty notch sign it only differs in the fact that it is not a complete absence so when it's it's not empty necessarily but there is a gap or there is a hyperintense line separating the two so that's called a gap sign and if there is no gap so you can see that uh, at the tibia uh, femoral attachment there is a hypointensity over there so remember that as you go from the tibial attachment to the femoral attachment the acl becomes darker and darker it becomes more and more hypo intense and uh, at the femoral attachment it has to be jet black so if there is no gap then it is normal this is another sign you have to look for it's what's called the footprint sign that means you look at the tibial attachment if there is an absence or a hyper intensity at the tibial attachment or partially like it's sort of a fluid signal rather than just a subtle hyper intensity then it is suggestive of a partial tear of the acl so this is a partial low grade partial tear of the acl so when you have more of the fibers which are cut then it is a high grade partial tear so if there is no footprint sign then it is normal acl uh, these are basically easier to identify structures you have the mcl which is a normal hypointense structure here a grade 2 e mcl injury which is a partial tear of the mcl when it is through and through when it is transected then that's a grade 3 mcl injury with lag ligamentous laxity these are all pretty easy to identify shouldn't be too hard the about the posterior lateral corner I'll, I'll, uh, i'll discuss it in the next session because it has a it is a sort of a complicated anatomy but these are fundamentally how you can identify the easier types of posterior lateral corner injuries when there is a complete lcl tear or when there is a fibular avulsion that's the biceps tendon and that's the lcl and that's a fibular avulsion and this is an mpfl there are certain patterns that you have to look for in uh, medial patellofemoral ligament injuries of patellar dislocation which i'll discuss in the next uh, session what is the diagnosis in this case now here you can see this is a midline sagittal image okay this is a midline sagittal image can anyone tell what is the diagnosis this is sort of a spot diagnosis yes ali has said it's a mucoid mucoid degeneration yeah this is 
someone has one gesture said it's an acl tear it's not an acl tear but this is this yeah this is a mucoid degeneration yes someone has said the sign is well stuti has said it is a celery stalk appearance of the mucoid degeneration so this is a celery celery stalk appearance of the mucoid degeneration the uh, the acl is not just uh, diffusely hyper intense but it has this sort of a typical appearance and it's also diffusely thickened so that is uh, a mucoid degeneration of the acl now there are certain recent advancements one is cartigram which helps in identifying early chondromalacia i'll get to that in the next session there's also this is a dedicated msk uh, mri where uh, the patient sits comfortably and only his knee joint is imaged and more often than not these these images are of very good or a very superior quality it's almost as good as a 3t image though the machine itself is just a 1.5t and uh, obviously there's no claustrophobia when you're doing this especially for joints this can be useful now this is where the world is headed this is a 70 and just uh, look i mean if you're a radiologist you will just look at this uh, in all like you're looking at the mona lisa you just look at the uh, the detail that you are able to image right now it's just uh, beyond words so in such instances when you have a 70 mr obviously you needn't uh, look at the indirect signs because you can say if the acl is torn and you can say how much of the acl is torn in fact so now it's your turn look at these images i'll pause when necessary and i hope you can give me a diagnosis this is a lateral meniscus how do you know it's lateral you can see the fibula now please have a look at these and as soon as you get the diagnosis put it up in the chat and scrolling through okay that's the end so we started off we are you just count the number of sections in which you can see the lateral meniscus that's the clue so basically these are four mm sections and you can see them the lateral meniscus the body of the lateral meniscus in more than four sections so it's a this is what's called the yeah that's that's the right answer rohan and uh, sumana have given the right answer that's a discoid lateral meniscus okay so when you take the transverse measurement of the body this you can see it's more than 26 mm so that's a discoid lateral meniscus so discoid lateral meniscus can sometimes be tricky because there can be complete discoid lateral meniscus there can be partial discoid lateral meniscus so it may be difficult or uh, partial discoid lateral meniscus may sometimes be missed so this lateral meniscus no unless we specifically look for the discoid meniscus it these may be missed so always have it uh, make it a point to look when you look at the lateral meniscus to try to count how many sections of the lateral meniscus body you are able to appreciate before the appearance of the bow tie sign bow tie sign is nothing but the meniscus gets split into the anterior and posterior horns and therefore you will be able to see that bow tie appearance now that's another spotter coming up what do you think is the diagnosis over here i just want you to tell me about the acl alone forget the mcl for now yes the mcl is also injured in this what do you think the acl status is in this one is the acl normal is it abnormal someone said mucoid it's not mucoid it's again it's not thickened and it doesn't have the yeah partial rupture again don't uh, i would uh, you know uh, stay away from using the term rupture unless it's completely torn it's a partial acl tear that's the right answer uh, you call it a rupture when it's completely torn otherwise you can call it a partial tear this is a partial tear of the acl again you have to characterize it whether based on how much of the acl the thickness of the fibers which are torn if it is more than 50 or 75% then you obviously call it a high grade partial tear if it is less than that this is about 25% of the thickness it's a low grade partial tear also you can see that the orientation is nearly parallel to the blumen sart line so probably this is a low grade partial tear of the acl now what is the status of the acl in this one yes someone has said that that is the gap sign that is the gap sign good Faisal has got it right there. 
okay this 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 acl is normal right uh, the female attachment it is jet black the acl is looking nice and taut over here the subtle hyperintensity towards the tibial attachment is normal the acl is normal in this case what about this one have a look at this and can you identify what is wrong this is a pd image it's not a t2 it's a pd it's not an fs also it's just a pd plain pd image it's coronal obviously low grade partial tear no i thought you meant the probably you probably meant the last one someone said arthrosis no again look at the menisci can you see the menisci are they normal or abnormal you can see that's one meniscus over here that's a medial that's a lateral meniscus the lateral meniscus looks significantly thin no look at the bodies compare the bodies of the two menisci the lateral meniscus is significantly thin and you can see some subtle hyperintensity through that as well and what is this thing doing here it shouldn't be there right these are the cartilages forget the cartilages what is this doing here so that's the bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus okay coming on to the fifth case okay we are scrolling that's lateral this is the i mean this is the fibula so that's this is a left knee you can just look at the menisci and just leading you towards the answer okay this is the medial meniscus you should be expecting to see some hypointensity over there so what type of a tear is it and you have the medial meniscus posterior root i mean posterior horn and it is absent in this region yes stuti has said it's a root tear it is a root tear of the medial meniscus posterior horn we'll go into the next session it is going to be harder than this okay amma do you think this is useful for them uh, are they finding are they uh, finding it useful am i audible yeah you are no uh, i was muted no for sure i think uh, all of the, the the students are finding it uh, useful and that shows okay. from uh, the active participation that we are getting Great. i think i think we should continue and uh, finish uh, the last portion of our talk we are running yeah. a bit slightly late but i think it will be okay. better to cover it uh, in one go rather than doing another talk fine 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 i'll just uh, go in a little quickly this is going to be a little harder but then let's go i'll try to finish it in probably 15 minutes or so okay this is uh, a little advanced okay what do we miss now the the whole concept is when you know a little bit about the mri of the knee and you have the fundamentals you tend to think that you know all of it but there's a lot more to it than it first seems so what are the common findings that we miss especially the novice radiologist and certain lessons from my past experiences and the experiences of others what are the clinical implications of uh, missing some of these important findings and a couple of interesting cases cases let's start with the i've i've, I've planned this talk uh, as in within outward and i've also kept the most interesting part for the last so this we are starting with an outward again we had a discussion about the lateral meniscus discoid lateral meniscus regarding the lateral meniscus remember that uh, the whole idea of taking a fixed measurement of the lateral meniscus 15 mm or 16 mm or absence of the bow tie appearance past three or four sections or 3 mm sections and so on the whole idea is flawed uh, because uh it, it takes into consideration that the uh, the uh, the mri or the the sizes of the lateral meniscus of say 11 year old girl and a 40 year old man are the same but it's not the same so the better way is rather than taking a, a fixed measurement as 15 or 16 mm as a cut off what you have to do is take the measurement of the lateral meniscus to the tibia and you take the lateral meniscus ratio the horizontal measurement of the body to the tibia ratio and once you do that you are in a better position to call it a complete or a partial discoid lateral meniscus so this article is useful for that now again we are looking at this 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 image i hope i'll get answers from you okay let's start off we are looking from uh, this is a medial meniscus okay we are looking at the images sagittal image from medial to lateral the one thing that you can note over here is there is a difference in the sizes of the meniscus the normal orientation or the a uh, thing that you expect is lost right over here you can see i'm just going with the answers as well so that 
because we need to cover a little quickly. You can see some meniscal tissue over here. As we go more and more centrally, you can see meniscal tissue over here. This is the double PCL appearance of the bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus, right? Now, that's the anterior root of the lateral meniscus. That's the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, the posterior root and the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Here, the meniscus is absent. So what could this be? You can see the meniscus is absent in the lateral meniscus, a part of the lateral meniscus. There is an empty meniscus sign of the lateral meniscus, right? So in the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So what could this be? That's the body of the lateral meniscus. Now we are looking at the coronal images of the same patient. So you can see that this is medial, that's lateral. How do you know? Look at the fibula first. So orient yourself, that's lateral, that's medial. And when you look at these images, you can uh, see that the medial meniscus, this is the medial meniscus, okay? There's some meniscal tissue over here. So that's a bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus. And as you go more posteriorly, you can see that there is a discontinuity of the body, posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So that's a, what type of a tear is this? That's the radial tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus involving both the central and peripheral zones. So that is how you characterize the tear. The bucket handle tear, you needn't say where it is involving because obviously it's involving the anterior horn body and the posterior horn. So that's a bucket handle tear and that's the radial tear of the uh, lateral meniscus, the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So that's a bucket handle tear. That's the, and I hope you've picked this one as well. That's a little harder. I mean, this is a, you can see that the ACL is not becoming brighter and brighter as it reaches towards the femoral, femoral attachment. And therefore, this is a partial ACL injury as well, partial or a low grade ACL injury as well. A low grade or rather high grade. Yeah, the ACL is absent in this. It's not very clearly delineated here, but that is an ACL injury as well. Now, what is the problem here? Can you identify the pathology here? I've just actually shown the screen by mistake, the slide by mistake, but this, you can see that the, the uh, articular cartilage is deficient over here. So make it a point that you don't just look at the menisci, but always look at the surfaces of the, uh, the bone as well. So if you can see that the articular cartilage is deficient, that is a focal chondral defect or a chondromalacia. So sometimes the sizes of the uh, articular cartilage loss, uh, this is best appreciated on T2 in this sequence, in this, uh, in this uh, patient. So sometimes it is better seen on T2. And uh, sometimes you'll be able to identify this loose body, chondral loose body as well. The defect can sometimes be quite sizable. So on arthroscopy or uh, when they do a surgery, they'll be able to see such a large defect. And these are things that we should generally not miss. It is easy to miss, mind you. So the next question is, what's the best sequence for imaging of the articular cartilage? What is the best sequence for identifying articular cartilage injuries? Okay. I'll just, yeah, DES, someone Suthi has said DES, yes. So yeah, DES and WATS and so on, it's known in different names by different vendors, but WATS and DES are the best sequences. You can see the beautiful PD, I mean, uh, the uh, petalar articular cartilage over here. You can see the trochlear cartilage and the other cartilages as well. And you can plan these in the axial as well as sagittal planes. For as far as MR is concerned, we use what's called the modified auto bridge grading, grade zeros when there is no cartilage loss. Grade one is when there is subtle softening, but no tear. Grade three is when there is fissuring, but it's not reaching uh, up to 50% of the thickness. Grade three is when it is going, extending beyond 50% of the thickness of the articular cartilage. Grade four is when it is full thickness defect and reaching the surface of the bone with subtle bone changes. So these are the grades of the articular cartilage injuries. It is basically an arthroscopy based grading, but it can sort of be extrapolated into MRI as well. So here you have an articular cartilage uh, injury. So chondromalacia, you can grade them based on uh, the grading uh, we had discussed uh, on the modified auto, auto bridge grading. Sometimes in young patients, it may be useful to do this. This is called the cartigram and where you should be able to see a normal gradation between the surfaces, the articular surface, as well as the bony surface. 
and when you see a different difference in color there are certain uh, uh, articles that you can look for for cartigram and this can suggest uh, early chondromalacia change sometimes there may not be a defect per se but just a subtle softening of the articular cartilage so the posterolateral corner coming on to the posterolateral corner this is what's called the dark side of the knee simply because of the complex anatomy and it is difficult to identify all the structures and people generally are not very well oriented into the uh, normal appearances of uh, these structures what are the different components the lateral collateral ligament which is the most important component then you have the popliteus tendon you have the popliteus muscle over here it comes in and gets inserted into uh, into the insertion of the lateral femoral condyle that's the popliteus tendon popliteo fibular ligament is uh, this structure over here which is the uh, it is from the uh, popliteus tendon to the fibular attachment you have an arcuate ligament which is nothing but the condensation of the posterolateral joint capsule fibers and you have a biceps tendon some people do consider it as a part of the posterolateral corner some people do not you have a fibello fibular ligament when the fibula is present this is the fibula and when it is present you can have the fibello fibular ligament so why is it important why is the posterolateral corner important it is important because uh, it is one of the secondary stabilizers of the knee uh, after the cruciate ligament so it resists varus angulation and the important point to note is that many a times the plc injuries are commonly associated with the acl injuries and the acls do get repaired but sometimes the radiologists tend to under diagnose or miss uh, posterolateral corner injuries and because of that it is one of the common causes of failed knee even after repairing the acl the patient still has persistent uh, complaints of slipping and therefore it can lead on to accelerated osteoarthritis so these are things that you have to look for, for particularly in cases of multi ligament injuries of the knee so the key to identifying plc structures is more and more practice you have to look at it in all the cases in normal mris and therefore you will be able to identify it in abnormal cases that's the lateral collateral ligament okay you can see it from the lateral femoral to the fibular attachment and here you have a partial tear of the lcl especially towards the femoral attachment of the lcl okay as we scroll you can see there is partial injury i mean there is a tear of the popliteus tendon as well that's the popliteus tendon and you should normally see it getting attached over here but it is absent therefore there's a posterolateral corner injury in this case if you look closely this is the part of the popliteo fibular ligament again that is abnormal or injured as well so this is the uh, arcuate ligament again that is torn that's part of the this is the popliteus tendon which is injured as well so this what i'm trying to say here is you have to look at all the posterolateral corner structures in normal knees so that you will be able to identify abnormal knees abnormal uh, posterolateral corners if the posterolateral corner is called the dark side of the knee the posteromedial corner is called the hidden corner again because it is very often overlooked the component the most important component of the plc is the the semi membranosus tendon which has its different uh, expansions you have what's called a pol or a postero posterior oblique ligament and you have another opl also which is an oblique popliteal ligament it is it can get confusing the basic fundamental you have to know is that the pol is situated just posterior to the mcl that's the mcl and you have just posterior to the mcl it's just very similar to the mcl in its appearance that's the pol over here and you have an oblique popliteal ligament which is more posteriorly then you have the posteromedial joint capsule which is similar to the posterolateral joint capsule the posterior horn of the medial meniscus also forms a part of the posteromedial corner remember the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus does not form part of the posterolateral corner but here the meniscal tissue itself is also part of the posteromedial corner so basic thing to remember is pmc is everything in between the mcl here that's the mcl and the pcl here or the posterior cruciate ligament so you have medial collateral and posterior cruciate ligament everything in between is the posteromedial corner now why is this again this is one of the dynamic stabilizers and failure of one of these uh, stabilizers can re uh, result in altered biomechanics and therefore lead to injury again it can also cause failed knee post ligament reconstruction again uh, it, it often requires surgical repair the same things go between the posterolateral and posteromedial corners and uh, this can be clinically elicited as an anteromedial 
rotational instability. So sometimes the orthopedicians will be able to elicit it and it may go missed by the radiologist unless you look at the orthopedicians notes. And the key to identifying PMC, again, it's just more and more practice. So that's the medial collateral ligament, the posterior oblique ligament, or sorry, oblique, um, yeah, posterior oblique ligament, and you have the oblique popliteal ligament and the semimembranosus tendons. So it's similar to what you identify of the MCL. The POL is much similar to that. That's the semimembranosus. That's the oblique popliteal ligament over here. So sometimes you can see what's called a menisco capsular separation. That means just posterior to the medial meniscus, the margins may be irregular and the attachment of the posterior oblique ligament may not be very clearly seen. Remember that the posterior oblique ligaments also do give slips, just like you have the medial, menis uh, medial collateral ligament giving slips or uh, the menisco femoral and menisco tibial slips. Similarly, the posterior oblique ligament also gives slips. So when there is a tear over there, there can be a menisco capsular separation Sometimes it is difficult to differentiate this menisco capsular separation from the, uh, the uh, longitudinal tear of the peripheral zone of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between the two. The, uh, the way, the key in differentiating between the two is looking for the posterior margin. The margin is irregular, it's likely to be a menisco capsular separation and a ramp lesion. So this is what's called a ramp lesion. When you have a tear, sometimes the ramp lesion itself need not necessarily be in, in uh, along with a meniscal injury. The meniscus may still be intact, but you may have a ramp lesion which necessarily needs surgical repair. Sometimes on arthroscopy, uh, the radiologist report says that meniscus is normal. The, the, uh, the person who is doing the arthroscopy, the orthopedician is in for a surprise because he sees that the meniscus is normal, but sees that there is a ramp lesion which needs surgical repair. So this has to be looked into in all cases. Um, now, coming on to this, yeah, this is a posterior medial corner injury. You can see that there is a hyper intensity over here, which is the posterior oblique ligament. This generally you shouldn't be seeing this hyper intensity over here. So you have the posterior oblique ligament. It should be as dark as this. This is a medial collateral ligament, and posterior oblique and the oblique popliteal ligaments are injured in this case. That's a posterior medial corner injury. Can you identify the uh, posterior lateral corner structures here? That's the lateral collateral ligament coming and attaching to the fibula. Okay, that's the biceps tendon. And if you look closely, you will be able to see the popliteus tendon as well as the popliteo uh, fibula ligament as well. That's the popliteo fibula ligament. Now coming on to the patellar instability. Uh, fundamentally, what you, what you know is that there is a trochlear dysplasia because of which the patella can get subluxated or dislocated to the opposite side, to the lateral side. And because of that pattern of dislocation, there is often a contusion of the medial part of the patella and the lateral femoral condyle. That pattern of uh, dislocation can uh, indicate that there is actually a, a MPFL injury as well. So what are the three components that you have to necessarily assess in cases of patella dislocation? There are three things that you have to have to have to look for in cases of patella dislocation. You have to mention that in your report. Can anyone tell what are those three things that you have to look for in all cases of patellar dislocation? You can, whatever you know of, you can put that in the answer in the chat box. There are three things that you have to look for. Yeah, Stuti has said trochlear dysplasia, which is right. That's one of them. So three things you have to look for are position of the patella. That is also right, actually. It is the position of the patella with respect to the, the length of the patella, rather, with the length of the patella tendon. So if the position of the patella is high or high riding patella, or if it is low riding patella. So it's, it's what it's called patella alta or a patella baja, right? Then you have to look at the retinacula, bone marrow edema, the pattern of bone marrow edema, that's partly right, but uh, I mean, uh, I'm trying to, you're trying to assess what are the things which may have contributed to the patellar dislocation. So the first thing, of course, you have to look for is trochlear dysplasia. The second is patellar alter. And the third is what's called the lateralization of the tibial tuberosity, okay? So patellar instability is, is sort of complicated. It's like the orange justice. Now, uh, one of my, 
cousins actually dislocated his patella doing the orange justice if you know anything about uh, this tiktok dance uh, this is uh, something in a game which is called fortnite if you see this orange justice you can see the reason why people do manage to dislocate their patella there's an entire subreddit of individuals who dislocated their patella doing the orange justice so it's because you have a flexed internally rotated uh, knee and uh, a, with a planted foot with valgus rotation so basically everything that you are doing with the orange justice that is the mechanism of injury in a patella dislocation so these are the risk factors the importance of the risk factors is uh, because if you have one of those risk factors it puts the patient at a higher risk of uh, developing patella dislocation it's roughly like this if you have just trochlear dysplasia you are about 30% Uh, prone to develop uh, patella dislocation if you have a trochlear dysplasia as well as a patella alta you are about a 50 to 60% probably i mean uh, uh, prone to develop dislocation if you have all the three risk factors including lateralization of tibial tuberosity and uh, patella alta and a uh, trochlear dysplasia then you are more than 80% probably i mean you are at a higher risk of developing patella dislocation so that is the significance of risk factors in the absence of all these risk factors the traumatic dislocation of the patella is uncommon so the more the number of risk factors the more likelihood of dislocation and the more need for surgical correction patella dislocation is not suspected in as many as 50% of cases undergoing mri so always make it a point to ask specifically for patella dislocation ask leading questions and make sure the, uh, that they have not had uh, similar episodes in the past or recently so as far as the trochlear dysplasia is concerned you know that there is a digital classification the type 1 is only when there is a shallow sulcus type 2 is when there is facet asymmetry this is the medial facet that's the lateral facet so when the ratio is more than 40% i mean sorry less than 40% that means the medial facet is less than 40% as the of the length of the lateral facet that is when you have a type v type 3 is when there is a flat sulcus okay there is the the trochlear groove is the measurement is zero it's a flat sulcus and type d is when you have a bump so you can see the 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 trochlea is becoming progressively and progressively less and less uh uh, uh de in in depth and therefore uh, it this is these are the types of trochlea dysplasia as far as the insult salivary ratio is concerned the patella tendon length is to the patella length if it is more than 1.2 you have you can see that the patella is a high riding patella and it it makes the patient at a higher risk of developing patella dislocations remember that if it is just a patella alta it can be an isolated finding it need not necessarily mean that this patient is more at a risk of developing patella dislocation uh, but of course when it is associated with trochlear dysplasia or uh, a lateralized tibial tuberosity it does put them at a higher risk now this is what's called the lateralization of tibial tuberosity It, the the images do look confusing but it's quite simple these are actually superimposed images that's the femur here and that's the tibia okay what you have to do is draw a line through the intertrochlear uh, this is the intertrochlear region this is the um, sorry this is the uh, intercondylar region you draw a line and you draw another parallel line through the tibial tuberosity the distance between the two is measured if it is more than 15 mm then it is abnormal so if it is it basically means is that when the patella is moving superiorly and inferiorly as it tracks superiorly and inferiorly if the tibia is more laterally placed it puts them at a higher risk of subluxating or dislocating laterally so that's the significance of lateralized tibial tuberosity so trochlear dysplasia uh, facet asymmetry i told you how to measure that this is how you measure trochlear depth there are several articles for the same so basically what you're looking for is how deep this is if it is less than 3 mm then it is abnormal and this is what's called the lateral inclination angle and if it is less than 11 degrees then it is abnormal this is how you measure the trochlear sulcus if it is more than 140 degrees sorry if uh, yeah if it is more than 140 degrees then it is likely to be abnormal that means the sulcus is shallow now as far as mpfl is concerned it's easy to identify acute tears okay of the mpfl because you can see hyper intensity waviness and fluid signal it's easy to identify 
but when there are chronic mpfl injuries it may be difficult to identify sometimes the mpfl injury the injured chronic mpfl injury it may be slightly thicker than normal sometimes the mpfl may be thin and may not be clearly outlined at all especially towards the femoral attachment so it might be difficult or a little tricky to call an mpfl tear an mri has an 80% sensitivity for proven mpfl tears remember that even in proven mpfl through and through tears 20% of the cases you may miss uh, those cases even in retrospect mind you so there is also the problem of variable thickness in individuals so the ideal way to do is if you are suspecting an mpfl tear or a thinning or a chronic mpfl tear in one patient it's ideal to do the opposite knee as well for comparison it may not be possible in all cases but it is ideal so you also have to identify the or define the site of injury whether it is towards the patellar attachment or whether it is in the mid substance or towards the femoral attachment you have to have an idea about what are the surgical corrections on offer one is of course trochleoplasty in which you can correct the depth of the trochlea the tibial tuberosity transfer uh, from the lateral aspect it is uh, transferred more medially so that the patella tracks normally and there is also what's called the medial reconstruction so these surgical options are there on offer so when you have this in mind while you are reporting a case of patella dislocation it's always easier to uh, you know write these points so what are the things that you have to write in all these cases there are a couple of things that you have to write number one just remember this is a easy way of remembering you have to write one type what type of a trochlea it is so you have to write the disjour type as it's a type a b c or d you have to measure one length that is the trochlea depth whether it is less than 3 mm or more than 3 mm and one ratio that is a medial facet to lateral facet ratio if it is less than 40% or not you have to measure two angles the sulcus angle and the lateral inclination angle if it is more than 140 degrees or not and the lateral inclination angle 11 degrees is the cut off so these are the things that you have to mention in all the cases of trochlear dysplasia now a couple of more interesting cases this is this is how i'm going to wind up my talk and these are like really hard cases if some of you answer this real it's like phenomenal okay so i'll really i mean uh, uh, i'll clap for you so this is is starting off just have a look at this tell me what you feel yeah, this is lateral to medial okay you know something's wrong with the meniscus okay there's some meniscal tissue here something wrong lateral meniscus right that's the pcl looks like a double pcl acl stone mind you something here as well that's a medial meniscus so there's something wrong here and that's a medial meniscus so can someone identify what's wrong here you have seen i'll just scroll through again that's the lateral something wrong here pcl something wrong here acl is gone something wrong here something wrong here as well unhappy triad no unhappy triad is the over don hue triad basically it's the injury of the l a the acl medial meniscus and the mcl okay these three things are very commonly uh, injured together but th this is not an unhappy triad this is the coronal image of the same thing okay yeah the mcl is injured yes what can you identify over here this is something very interesting like i told you you look for the central structures you should be able to see only the cruciates but can you see something else over here okay we'll just go back to the images i'll try to help you out this is a tough one but yeah so this is you know that the lateral meniscus is injured right okay as you go centrally you can see what looks like a double pcl sign that's the pcl that's a pcl and that's the double pcl or the meniscal tissue mimicking the pcl there's another structure over here which is looking like another pcl right i've already gone past this section the acl is torn there's another structure over here and that's the medial meniscus in fact so there is meniscal tissue is over here there's meniscal tissue over here as well so you can see this is taken from uh, an uh, article that's one that's two that's three that's four so apart from the cruciates you are able to see two different structures now this is what's called the quadruple cruciate sign 
okay you have not but one but you have one two three four three structure four structures which is towards the central part where you should normally be seeing only two that is you should normally be seeing only the cruciates this is what's called the quadruple cruciate sign this is what's called a simultaneous bicompartmental medial as well as lateral bucket handle meniscal tears so this is this is only the second known case uh, this was a study done in 2005 only the second known case and i think i have got the third known case this is our case here whereby you can see that's the right acl which is torn there's an empty notch sign the acl here that's the pcl that's the medial meniscus here that's the lateral meniscal tissue so this is a quadruple cruciate sign of a bicompartmental simultaneous bucket handle tear of both menisci that's a zoomed in image showing that uh, the quadruple cruciate sign now we are looking at the medial meniscus this is another case or oh, stuti has said bucket handle tear of bilateral man you got it well done it's not not exactly bilateral because bilateral means it has to be right and left but yeah you i i think you have the right idea it's both the menisci right so you're scrolling through what is this now can you identify what's wrong with the meniscus here that's the acl that's the pcl do you get this what's wrong with the meniscus here that's okay this is a, a little tough one this is another rare case this is what's called a complete discoid medial meniscus remember that discoid lateral meniscus yes some people have answered discoid that's right it is discoid but it is a complete discoid right but the fun thing is it's not the medial it's not the lateral meniscus mind you here there is no fibula so this is a medial meniscus you are looking at the complete discoid medial meniscus is extremely rare lateral meniscus is very common complete discoid medial meniscus extremely rare we call the patient back and screen the other uh, knee as well this patient had bilateral complete discoid medial meniscus there's a tear over here there's an intra substance injury as well uh, in the right there is a complete tear as well so there is degenerative injury of the meniscus over there now this is another knee this patient had clicking sensation of the knee and some sort of give like a uh, patient had some sort of laxity of the knee okay you're looking at the medial to lateral images look at the meniscus it looks fairly okay posterior cruciate ligament looks normal acl mildly bright yeah not very sure if it's bright or not of course you can confirm with the other sequences looking at everything over here looks fine acl looks fine the lateral collateral ligament ligament i'm mean, sorry lateral meniscus looks okay and you have seen the posterolateral corner everything look, looks okay right okay except for minimal effusion over here everything looks normal right in this knee bone marrow signal is normal now we are coming to t2 okay look at the t2 and try to identify if you can see something wrong Did you get it? Then this is the axial to show the same pathology. Did you get it? Yeah, this is a tough one. So this is actually, can you see it here? This is the coronal. It is easily missed unless you look for it specifically. Of course, in the coronal, it will be easier seen. It's better seen now. Someone said, what loose body? um focal pvns good guess close yeah it's not a pvns because we had done a gradient it's it is not gray, uh, dark on someone has said intraarticular loose body close but you see that if it's an intraarticular loose body there are no cartilaginous defects or bony defects at all but it's a good guess i have to say pvns is also a good guess this is actually a cyclops lesion so this was actually a cyclops lesion associated with an an intact native acl remember that cyclops lesions are often associated with acl reconstructions because there will be some sort of focal arthrofibrosis which gives rise to rise to that cyclops lesion and if you have a doubt about why we call it a cyclops lesion just one look of the arthroscopy image and you can see that there is a sprained acl and a cyclops 
and this is why it's called a cyclops lesion so this is in fact this is a cyclops lesion that occurred in the absence of a prior acl reconstruction sometimes when you just have an acl mild laxity of the acl sometimes you do you can have ligament i mean uh, cyclops lesion so what i want to you to uh, I mean take home from this this uh, case particularly is that if you look only at a pdfs it's very easy to call this a normal it's very easy to overlook this but if you looked at the t2 definitely you will pick this up and you have confirmed it on axial as well this is the axial so uh, the thing is you have to look and and coronal later so you have to look at all the sequences right so uh, the take home points assess the posterior lateral and posterior medial corner in all the cases and all it takes is a lot of practice and give special attention to the articular cartilages make it a point to mention the articular cartilage in your report as well even if it's normal even if it's a young individual when you mention it in the report you make it a point to look at it in all the cases and that's when you'll be able to pick subtle defects or chondromalacia early chondromalacia changes in the young as well as elderly make sure to look at all the sequences and do not skip sequences it may i may have missed the uh, cyclops lesion had i just looked at pdf sequences alone so do not skip sequences and uh, the the whole uh, idea of getting better is the japanese principle of kaizen that is follow up all your cases build a good rapport with the orthopedicians and continually improve the practice uh, of reporting mri of the knee and uh, the last take home point is don't do the orange justice dance especially if you have trochlear dysplasia so it takes a wise man to learn from his mistakes but an even wiser man to learn from others i hope uh, I, this talk has helped all of you to learn from my mistakes and others and uh, therefore i hope uh, you will do a better work thank you all these are people who have helped me along the way dr brigadier k sahu is my these are my mentors dr matthew cherry and dr jagdish these are my friends uh, who have helped me along the way thank you all for a patient hearing uh, this is my mail id you can get in touch with me if you've got any doubts that's my whatsapp number you can get in touch with me i can give you the references to this talk as well thank you so much for a patient hearing uh thank you dr koya that was a wonderful talk uh, uh the great the, the best thing there's so many good things about the talk but the best thing i felt was uh, many a times when speakers are giving uh, their talks uh, uh, most of it is talking about their knowledge but i like how you emphasized on sharing uh, your knowledge uh, through the learners so i believe that Uh, how much the learners take home is more important uh, than how much you know and your talk was brilliant example for that so thank you for putting that extra effort to make sure uh, that you simplify concepts like for example uh, the mechanisms of injuries i find them very difficult to remember but you gave a, a few uh, interesting ways to remember that so thank you for that thank you so much and i'm okay. sure all of us uh, all of our viewers uh, like the talk let me just uh, check the chat if there are any questions in the meanwhile if you can stop sharing the screen that would be great yeah. thank you uh, so i don't see any questions but uh, thank you for sharing your email and uh, number so if you if anybody has any queries uh, you can either leave them in the comments or uh, drop an email to dr koya and he'll be more than happy to uh, reply i'll request him uh, to share his uh, uh references with me and i can leave them uh uh i'll leave a link to those uh in the description so that sure. uh, uh, others can check them out uh, thank you again uh, uh jasim for joining me for this talk and uh, we shall see uh, you guys in our next video or uh, next saturday so we do these every saturday at 8 pm india time and uh, uh 10:30 am eastern time so if you're new here make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, Uh, join us for our next talk uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, live for those who are watching it later you can also check out uh, these other msk videos that we have on our channel thank you thank you jasim once again and i hope you I hope that you join us again on our platform thank you amar my pleasure it's always a pleasure to join you thank you so much